Welcome, everyone. My name is Lisa Lunghofer. I'm the executive director of the Gray Muzzle Organization. I'm joined by my colleague, Laura Merrick. Can you give a wave, Laura? <laughs> um, she and I will be fielding questions, and we are delighted to have Dr. Heidi Lowprize here presenting today. Um, so before I introduce her, I just wanted to let you know that we will be taking questions. So if you're joining us on Zoom, please feel free to enter your questions in the Q&A box. If you are joining us on Facebook, uh, type your questions in the comments and we will be sure to get to as many as we possibly can, hopefully all of them. All right, so with that, let me introduce Dr. Lowprize. She graduated from Texas A&M University and became a board certified veterinary dentist in 1993. In 2003, she joined the veterinary specialty team of Pfizer Animal Health, and in 2010, she became the senior technical manager for Burbeck Corporation. In 2014, Dr. Lowprize returned to dental specialty practice in Flower Mound, Texas. She is the author of three dental texts, including the second edition of Five Minute Veterinary Consult, Clinical Companion Small Animal Dentistry, and she also lectures internationally. She helped organize and was the first president of the International Veterinary Senior Care Society, whose mission is to provide resources targeting the complete healthcare needs of senior pets to veterinarians, their teams, and clients. So we are delighted to have you here with us today, Dr. Lowprize. Um, she's also a member of our Gray Muzzle Advisory Board, and we're just really excited to to hear all of the wonderful things that I'm sure you're going to tell us about and, and the great tips that, that you have to share to help us help our senior dogs thrive. So with that, I will turn the virtual floor over to you. Thank you so much, Lisa and Laura. Yes, so you heard that uh, I'm a dental specialist, veterinary dental specialist, but over the years, I've had uh, much more interest in overall senior care too. So I'll answer as much of this questions as I know with specifics, uh, because I've also been in general practice quite a bit. But if there's some that we can't answer specifically, we'll make sure that we get back to you with after I speak with one of my uh, so my colleagues that might have a more direct answer for something like that. So the my interest with these senior pets is that there's so many things that can happen. And it really takes a team to help work with these dogs and cats. And uh, there's a group that we're putting together called the Senior Pet Advocates. We want you to be able to be good advocates for the health of your senior pet. I mean, yeah, puppies and kittens are cute. Sometimes we wish they could stay in that little cuddly stage and everything else. But uh, then there's house training. And we have a little over a year old cat. He's over there sleeping right now, what we like to say recharging, um, whose nickname is Frank Nato. And the activity levels can sometimes be a little bit excessive. So our two, one senior, one mature kitty cats, they're sometimes easier just to sit next to and cuddle and everything else. And then we'll watch Frank play. But that's where seniors have such, such a place in our hearts. Because especially if you've had them since a kitten, or maybe you've adopted them later, they really become part of the family. And we know there are so many benefits with that human animal bond that continue through these senior stages. What we wanna make sure is that we do the best for our senior pets. And that means caring for them throughout those different life stages, puppy or kitten, juvenile, young adult, mature adult, senior to even geriatric. And when we do that continuum of care, we can not only make them healthier, but we can make their life last longer too. Part of what is important to have the combination of both the pet owner, the pet parent, and the veterinarian team is the pet owner sees what's happening on a daily basis. And they're gonna be more aware of certain changes, but we have to be careful because sometimes these changes can happen so gradually, you might not be aware that it's a change that we can intervene in. You may just think it's a change that's supposed to happen, but maybe it is the early part of a disease that we can actually help treat. The other thing is pets 
cats and dogs, whatnot. Sometimes they'll hide those early signs, or sometimes it'll be a mass that's not easy to see. So with regular professional care and good observation at home, good care at home, we can really improve the life, lives of our pets. So with dogs in particular, it's not real easy trying to figure out what is senior and what their relative age is. We always used to say, oh, dog years multiplied by seven, but that's a little too simple because that really only applies to medium-sized dogs. Cats are pretty easy. There's a junior, adult, middle adult, senior, geriatric. But as we look at our dogs, larger dogs age more rapidly and smaller dogs age more slowly. So that's why we need to be sure we know basically how big they are and then their relative age so we can determine, are they healthy adults? Are they seniors? So we're gonna take it from that as well. So when we look at a senior pet, the animal, American Animal Hospital Association has set a definition of the last 25% of that life expectancy. Now that's easy to say if you know exactly what your pet's life expectancy is gonna be. So sometimes we have to kind of guesstimate that based on breed, based on size. We'll sometimes use geriatric when they've reached what we expected, that 100% life expectancy, or if they're that senior age and have more medical problems. We're certainly gonna know there's a lot of size and breed differences, and even within that size or breed, there are individual variations, just like with people. There are some very young 70 year olds. And then we see some that are 40, 45 that are in horrible health shape, depending on many factors. So here's one chart that looks at comparing a pet's actual age, taking their weight into consideration, and remember, this should be healthy weight. We're gonna talk about overweight pets in just a little bit. So I had a 13 year old greyhound who was between 30, sorry, my apologies, around 58 pounds. So at 13 years old, he was about 82 when he passed. That's not too bad. But if we have a greyhound, sorry, a great Dane, at six or seven years, we're now looking at senior years for those giant breeds. And that 10 pound chihuahua or a poodle is not gonna be senior till nine or 10 years of age. So seven is not automatically senior. So we need to be able to try to determine what the relative age is. If you got your pet when they were very young, you know their birthday. But what about if you adopted an adult pet from a shelter? Now, typically speaking, I will see if they look at a fairly healthy adult, not too old, they'll usually list them at about two years of age if they don't know their actual age. And if they look that they a little bit older, they'll usually be listed at around seven years of age. So these are guesstimates. And we have to work within that guess to determine how old they truly are. Sometimes in looking at x-rays of teeth, we can tell that an animal is a bit older than what they had guessed, uh, but it's not terribly accurate. So we do have to re just rely on general body condition as well. And remember, like I said, it depends on that individual as well. So as we look at lifespan, we're talking about how many years we anticipate the general life expectancy. And I like going beyond just thinking about the quantity to think about the quality of life. So I like to use the term health span, not just the number of years, but good quality years. And as we look at that quality of life, there's many scales we can use, QOL scales. And a lot of times it's with quality of life for cardiac disease, quality of life for tumors, quality of life for osteoarthritis, things like that. Or it's also used when you're coming to that decision is it time? Well, I like to think about that quality of life being looked at throughout the patient's life. And there are several things that we look at. That's where working with your pet's information that you know, with your veterinary team, you can really see what that quality of life is 
and you can enhance it and make it better wherever possible. So we need a lot of information as veterinary professionals when we go to the veterinarian and have our pets taken there. Sometimes that appointment time is really short and we don't have time to talk about every single thing with a senior pet. So at times it's good to request a longer or two slots for appointments to go over multiple items. And in fact, if you have, go to a veterinarian who does a lot of senior care, they may have a longer time slot for senior pet care. Certainly, some of the big questions we'll ask, um, how are they moving around? Are they comfortable? Does, do they seem to be in any, any pain? We really need to evaluate their body condition, and I'll go into this a little bit more uh, in detail in just a little bit. Nutrition is gonna be a big part of how we manage our senior pets. And then how's that nutrition coming through? How are their, how are their bathroom habits? Are there any changes? Is there any more water that they're drinking and urinating? And especially with seniors, we start seeing some behavior issues that can be part of the medical issues. But sometimes those behavior issues are some of the more challenging things to try to manage and sometimes a little bit discomforting. So as we see these pets, we like to recommend a good physical exam every six months. Now that may seem like a lot, and if you have an anxious pet, we'll do everything from using some special medications to keep them from getting less anxious to special treats while we're there. But the thing of it is that six months, even if we go with the average seven years per human year, that's three and a half to four years of age. And if as a senior person, I waited every four years to get an exam, chances are I'd start having some problems crop up in between those times. And then certainly if there's ever any concerns, any kind of injury, any kind of GI problems, gastrointestinal problems, things like that, you're certainly going to take them in when they're having an illness issue. But a good wellness exam is going to give a good baseline of data, continued data. And so many times when we're looking at these senior pets, whether we do the blood work every six months or at least every 12 months, your analysis blood pressure, maybe even chest x-rays and abdominal x-rays, we may not see a lot of overt disease, but if we start seeing slight trends towards having issues such as kidney issues or maybe a heart murmur or things like that, we can intervene earlier in the course of the disease and help minimize its effects. We're also gonna be talking about nutrition. And I'll be honest with you, Nutrition is not my, my full boat that I would like to have. If there's a practice you go to that has multiple veterinarians and even technicians, they may have someone at that practice who has a, the best comfort level. We're talking about nutrition and nutritional changes. I'm going to mention body condition again. We're going to talk about that. And then comfort levels, pain. Discomfort is one of the most important things we can manage with our senior pets. So here's an article a while back that was taken when they took in apparently healthy senior cats. And for cats, 11 is considered senior. And these were cats who were showing no signs of disease, good body shape, everything else seemed okay. And look at how many had problems. Almost 30%, I apologize for the two kidney disease, one, there are two different types, but about 30% had some level of kidney disease starting Almost a quarter had thyroid disease. Almost a quarter had diabetes. The 3% is urine and the glucose. And then heart murmurs and blood pressure. So yeah, we don't like to find these things, but if we find them on our tests before they are clinically ill, then we can proactively treat these pets. My own 16 and a half year old kitty cat started to have some slight increases in his kidney values. So while he's still doing pretty darn well, other than weight loss that cats get at that age, we've now adjusted his diet. We've gone with medications in case he ever has any nausea and we're ready to give fluids in case he ever seems dehydrated. So 
I want to cover body condition and nutrition. And I see that we have one question that I might keep to the end because it's more general question right now. Body condition matches very closely with nutrition, but it also matches with the metabolism of the pet, other things as well. Why body weight is such a key factor. And in fact, not just body weight, but how much is fat? How much is lean? I, I really resemble this remark, but yeah, I know the, the challenges as we get older, uh, metabolism goes down, the, the body fat content goes up, the lean body mass, which is at basically everything but fat, but we think about muscle, but it's also heart, different things like that. That portion of the mass decreases. The thing is when we have a higher fat content, there's actually an inflammatory process that goes with the adipose tissue, with the with a fat tissue. And in fact, with this weight gain, there are some diseases that are greatly impacted. On the other side of the scale, weight loss is something we need to look at as well. If our pet is having weight loss without us trying to get them to lose weight, something may be wrong. So we need to get that checked out. Specifically with aging pets, certainly. In dogs, the metabolism goes down. They may not need as many calories, maybe more fiber. In cats, at 11, after the metabolism going down for a while, the metabolism actually starts going back up. So we sometimes need more calories. And if the kidneys are healthy, they may need more protein or at least better digestibility in their food components. So those components are very important in the digestibility of the of the components is important, especially in cats, not as much in dogs. They tend to maintain their digestibility. But sometimes it's not just the type of diet, but if they're having any troubles eating. So there is a website called the w WSAVA, the World Small Animal Veterinarian Association. And I have a few websites that I'll be talking about today that I'll be sure to sh share with Gray Muzzle so they can share it with you as well. So as veterinary practitioners, we love looking at BCS, body condition scores. And typically we'll use a nine point scale, but there's also a five point scale. And we look at that median, that ideal body weight. Yeah, there's gonna be a slight fat cover, but we can still feel the ribs. We can still feel the hips. You know, if we get a little too much, then all you can feel is the fat. And we like to look at them from a lateral view straight on, and then a skyline view from up top. Well, guess what? You can even keep those photos throughout the life of the pet and see where the changes are happening. And there's some good skills to look at. Wasaba is one of those. You can also learn how to palpate against the ribs. If you can still kind of feel the ribs, that's okay. You can't feel the ribs anymore. Then we may need to watch that body fat content. If you can really feel the ribs or really feel the spine, then we might have weight loss. And unless we've tried to do that, we need, really need to watch it. In fact, in feeling that spine or around the shoulders, sometimes we can even evaluate the amount of muscle, the lean body mass. And in veterinary clinics, looking at muscle condition scoring is just as important. So that's part of how we look at it. Next, we're gonna look at what happens when they are too heavy. When there is increased fat, first off, it's pretty much gonna decrease their activity level. So that's a snowball right there. And when we see that increased weight, now we have greater risk of arthritis. So now we have discomfort. And then it is gonna be more difficult to exercise. The, uh, additional fat can also exacerbate diabetes. So as we look at making adjustments to the diet, first off, always check with your veterinary team. You can actually calculate how much that pet should need by its lean body weight and make sure you add in whatever treats they get, whether it's dental chews or regular treats or they look up at you and you have that piece of cheese in your hand, everything counts. That's, that's one of my big issues personally is that everything counts. So including dietary adjustments, we can look at 
env environmental enrichments, doing things that they have to work to eat. There's some great food toys out there and exercise depending on the pet. There have been studies that show in pets and dogs with a restricted caloric diet, they live longer. The restricted caloric diet is sometimes very challenging to maintain. Multi-pet households, pets who have those big brown eyes just begging to have a little extra treat, but it's been shown that leaner lasts longer. Let me see real quick if any of our questions, um, as we look at uh, talking about a, a little dog that had all its teeth extracted will only eat kibble. You know what? Only eat kibble, can still feel the ribs and spine, very energetic. That is terrific. Keep up the good work at keeping them fairly healthy. Uh, the other things that we look at the uh, tremors and the bronchitis, we'll talk at the end of the presentation. Thank you for asking questions. So what about if they're too light? And I think we tend to see this more in cats, but then also in much older dogs. And it could be, maybe they're not eating great, you know? Sometimes behavior issues and cognition can impact that. Sometimes it's the mouth. If we have oral disease and discomfort, they may not be eating well. It's even more than that. We'll talk about the mouth in just a little bit. If the GI tract is not absorbing the foods, then the foods can't be utilized well. So again, dogs tend to absorb things pretty well. Their digestibility of components of the diet is pretty good. Cats, a lot of them tend to have a decrease in protein and even fat digestibility. And then when we do get the kitty cats that come in, I have had some that have been presented because they weren't eating real well and mouth didn't look so good. And they were listed as a heavy body condition score because they still had lots of fat. But if you felt the spine, there's hardly any muscle left. And when I see that kind of muscle wasting, then I have concerns that there's something not good. And it's usually cardiac disease, uh, tumor, something along those lines that's eating all the, all the body's resources, all the protein. It could also be GI issues as well. The thing of it is, what do you feed? And I tell you what, this, this is a quandary. Um, when we think about senior diets, and I'm not putting anybody's out specifically to say yes or uh, to say that they have bad senior diets, but AFCO that sets diets for young growing pets and mature stable pets, there are no guidelines for senior pets, not even general ones. So we may think about um, decreasing calories. That is only beneficial if they're overweight. Increasing fiber, that, that can help out with, you know, if they have any GI issues or weight issues. Um, antioxidants typically will not be an issue. Uh, that would probably be a good thing. But studies have been done looking at the components of what's called quote unquote senior diets, and it's all over the place. Protein content, fat content, fibers, sodium, things that we think we should look at closely. It's there, there's no guidelines, but at the same time, there's a, a lot of individual differences with the pets as well. So we have to look at the pet itself and that's where your veterinary team is gonna be one of your best consults. I kind of had to laugh with the picture on the lower right-hand side talking about the, the best five senior dog foods and they have a picture of a really cute puppy. It's not a senior dog, but that's okay. It made me look at the picture. Um, what I feel most comfortable about is with the larger, I know, food companies that have done guaranteed analysis, they have done digestibility tests, and they have research. Believe it or not, veterinarians don't get kickbacks from dog food companies. Yes, they may have some dog food that they carry in their clinics. It is one of the poorest income areas in a practice and most practice manager, ma management teachers tell you don't even carry foods. It's, it's a profit loss. So vets aren't making money on diet food recommendations. They're making 
recommendations for the best health for your pet. And a lot of times we rely on good research because if the research isn't there, especially with digestibility or things like that, we don't know what's gonna happen. And in fact, in the last several years, it's kind of what happened when we started looking at an increase in heart issues, cardiomyopathy. And as they looked at it, it was typically based on dogs. They called the BEG. They taught the boutique, the small, small group, small batch diets, the exotic type diets, and the grain-free diets. And in pets fed these bag diets, they were seeing an increased inflammation in the heart that was leading to cardiomyopathy that basically was reversible once a different diet was fed. But that it's, it's just one of those things that veterinary teams started seeing the change in the incidence of this disease and they could link it back to most of these diets. We were talking about wellness senior diets and then certainly if we have any, oh, we've got a visitor here, hold on. That's George, say hi, George. Okay, back to me. Um, another place where diets can be extremely helpful is when we start to see disease states. You notice I said, start to see. If we wait until a patient is in complete liver failure or kidney failure or heart failure, diets won't make a big difference. They'll help out a little bit. But what about if you've been doing that senior wellness, the exams, listening to the heart, getting the x-rays, getting the blood work, just like with Spot, who has some mild increase, increases in his um, kidney values. Well, he's now on a kidney diet, and I think he's already doing better. I'll take him in a few weeks to recheck his blood work. As you're looking at these diets, we're not just looking at specific diets, but there's also some good supplements that can be added to the diet to help with some of these things. I would say the biggest group is probably going to be those for osteoarthritis with some kind of, um, some kind of, you know, maybe a fatty acid, omega-3, something like that. Uh, and that can help out. There's even some joint diets that will help out with that initially. The thing of it is, you need to make sure your veterinary team knows everything your pet's getting so you don't get too much of one component that they maybe just need a little bit of, or to make sure that something they may be getting could interfere. And that's where we're going to, definitely going to talk about that with medications. So there's some good nutrition resources. Um, the Tufts nutritionists, they're amazing. There's other ones as well, but I just, I always go to the Tufts, the clinical nutrition science at Cumming School. In fact, they work with some of the human nutritionists as well. So one of their tabs is pet foodology. And they have many areas where you can look up and ask questions. They have blogs, they have articles, things like that. And they are the ones who did one of the studies looking at how many components were in senior diets and they were just all over the board. Think about it too. Um, we now have to be looking at if they just put seven for senior, that doesn't count for a small dog. So some of the pet food companies are now looking specifically at a smaller dog at nine, 10 or 11 as senior, which is a much better way to look at it. The other thing I wanna to touch on just briefly, and if you have questions, we, we can you know chat on the chat box. But I know there's, there's strong proponents either way for raw pet foods. I would like to propose, I have concerns with even if they're frozen and then thawed, there are pathogens can be in these foods. A great many of pets probably do well with it. But think about your seniors. Their immune system isn't as good. They're going to be more prone to have problems of anybody in that group. And of course, if you are feeding raw, uh, raw food diet, you're not supposed to let them lick you after you handle the food or after you handle them around their face you're supposed to wash your hands the possibility for having a problem especially if you have any immunocompromised comprom situations you really need to be cautious and the fda has a very good very good website um, that you can look at that and say if you are feeding raw food this is what you need to make sure you do okay now that I've got through the, the um, nutrition portion, 
I'm going to see if there's any particular nutrition questions or comments uh, why you guys are typing that in. I'm going to go to the bronchitis, has diagnosed with bronchitis after x-rays, blood tests, et cetera. End of the treatment with prednisone has started coughing and wheezing again. What can I do? The very first thing I'm going to tell you is to go back to your veterinarian. There is a chance with chronic bronchitis. And in fact, I've got chronic bronchitis on my, on my inhalers with prednisone and other medications that I have to be on for the rest of my life because there's this inflammatory process going on. So it could be that a lower dose of prednisone or possibly the prednisone when there's exacerbations of the problem may be sufficient. There's also some pets that we're able to use certain nebulizers with. So there's a number of things that are possible. If, um, if especially with the x-rays, it's really good to have those followed up on a sequential basis to see if there's any changes for the good for the worse, okay? So good luck with your multi Shih Tzu rescue. So let's see, 12 year old dog has tremors or shaking every night in his sleep. I don't think it's dreaming, it's only occurs when he's asleep. It doesn't look like seizures. My neck, the next step is a neurological workup. Is this warranted? Um, it's always a possibility that the neurological workup could show something that's going on in the brain specifically. Um, potentially, even with geriatric dogs, some of the sleep wake cycles are not what they used to be. Um, and even the cognition can have issues with that too. I'm going to type in something that you might ask them about uh, gabapentin, which may help them sleep a little bit better to begin with. And it's also an anti-seizural medication for neuropathies that might help. I don't want to second guess your vet, continue working with them. Okay. All right, we don't have any diet questions come up, so I'm gonna go to my one of my favorite topics and that's senior dental care. I did a full uh, senior dental care webinar with Gray Muzzle. And I tell you what, I, you know, I could probably get a less gross picture for you guys. Vets love these pictures because this is what we see a lot of days. With dental care, the most common problem we see is periodontal disease. And it's been shown that the incidence of periodontal disease is increased in older pets. Well, guess what? The teeth are there longer, especially if they haven't been treated. And in smaller dogs, because there's less bone, they're more crowded teeth. And guess what? Smaller dogs live longer. So at my practice, with my referrals that I get in, I see a lot of small old dogs. And while this certain can lead to tooth loss because the infection caused by bacteria that's not removed from around the tooth takes away bone and gum tissue, periodontal disease, we can lose teeth. It's okay to lose teeth by extraction. I prefer extracting them to rather than just falling out because it's gotten so infected. But if we don't intervene before the bone is bad, especially on the lower jaw, it can actually lead to bone, to jaw fracture. And then certainly in seniors, we also need to look at looking for tumors. So with senior dental care, there's always concerns, all right? But in my view, with very few exceptions, they are seldom, rarely too old. I recently did a consultation on a dog that has some gum issues that could be treated. He has severe pulmonary hypertension. And after his last cardiologist appointment, his cardiologist said, if he has to have a procedure, it would be best to be done at a university that has a full anesthetic team. So guess what? That's one dog I'm not going to treat, but it's very few. Once we get a good medical evaluation ahead of time, maybe we have a heart murmur. We're going to do some additional tests with that a blood test and chest x-rays. If those are completely normal and there's no clinical signs, no coughing, still going around good, no exercise intolerance, I'll even have people count the number of times they breathe when asleep. If they're breathing more than 30 times when they're asleep, that means the oxygen, the blood is not flowing adequately to get oxygen. And that's actually an indicator that there could be cardiac issues. So I look at these things. 
if they do have issues with the initial test, I have them go to cardiologist, get an ultrasound, an echo done. If that shows that there's a dish, that there are problems, then I'll have medications given until that dog is more stable. At that point in time, especially since the teeth can impact heart health, that chronic infection, that chronic inflammation is not good for the heart. Then we'll get the okay from the cardiologist or we have a stable dog. We personalize the anesthetic and pain protocols. A number of the dogs that are referred to me as a veterinary dentist come from general practitioners who give the option of, we're more used to doing advanced procedures on patients that are higher risk, and we can do it a little bit more quickly to decrease anesthetic time. But in most cases, the benefit greatly outweighs the risks. We just need to make sure that we have general anesthesia with a cuffed endotracheal tube, the breathing tube, to protect the lungs from any fluids or calculus or bacteria. We're gonna have an IV catheter and fluids, lots of monitoring. We use some very good monitoring units with very good technicians. Body warming units, because they can get chilled during these procedures, and we're gonna do good pain management. In fact, we're going to do pain management sometimes from the night before, certainly just before using blocks to help numb the area so we can lower our general anesthesia. And whenever possible, I try to minimize the anesthetic time, or I might set, split it up into two staged procedures. If it's going to be a really long procedure, say maybe full mouth extractions, I may do the left side one day and the right side a couple weeks later completely okay. And it's okay for regular practitioners to do this as well. Another part is good monitoring during recovery. Because once we take the endotracheal tube out, they look like they're waking up, we need to make sure they continue that recovery process without any issues. Okay, now let me see if we have any of the questions. Uh, this is kind of nutritional probiotics. Um, major food company recommended that probiotic and prebiotic supplements, are they worth the money? There are so many variable products out there, but in general, there are a lot of studies looking at the gut microbiome, what's in the GI system. And if there are any issues with that, it actually can increase inflammation, the gut inflammation. So again, with that aging process, we know a little bit more on the human side, uh, but if there are any GI issues, it can make a big difference in some of these pets. The, the condition of the, school, of the stool, how they're uh, digesting their food, everything else. So kind of watch for that too. I had uh, my old dog buddy, you see the picture here with his loop on, he actually had some pretty interesting diarrhea episodes that uh, he did a little bit better on some, on some medications. He actually responded best to fiber adding fiber to his diet, which is usually a weight loss product. Only thing Greyhound seems strange, but the fiber helped him. So with each pet, check with your vet and see what will be the best combination for them. Thanks for the question. So as we look at um, actually the vital signs, we used to talk about temperature, pulse, respiration, okay? Now they add in pain to that. And in fact, nutrition is part of that body condition. And so many times I think it's underdiagnosed because they're probably sleeping a little bit more or we think, oh, they're just getting old. Well, yeah, I'm getting old too, but I definitely know when I'm, when I'm feeling painful. And arthritis as a chronic pain, chronic inflammation can often happen gradually to where you really don't notice it as being an issue. In fact, so many times after I've treated a, an older patient, with dental care and I'd get them on pain medication for their surgery. And they ask how they did. And you know, once the pain medication stopped, how they were doing, well, they're still eating good, but he's slowing down a little bit. Well, sometimes pain medication can diagnose a painful condition when it's difficult to prove it with x-rays or, or exam. There's also pain from other diseases, everything from pancreatitis to stones, you name it. Uh, cancer can cause pain as well. So when we're looking at our older pets, discomfort is likely a reality, okay? And discomfort is not 
fun. So as we continue with pain, I'm gonna do a little bit of bad breath. Uh, someone adopted a senior dachshund last year, had already had a few extractions. She was better on antibiotics following the surgery, but back to normal, bad, bad breath when she was off them. She also has thyroid and stage two kidney disease. Um, you might double check and make sure they were able to take x-rays, okay? And in fact, if they weren't able to take x-rays, then we might need to look at getting another dental with x-rays done. And at that point, if you have any issues, you, you contact Gray Muzzle and they'll contact me and we, we can even look at those x-rays for you. So yeah, the bad breath, while there can be uh, uh, from the kidneys, in fact, you can you can smell uremic breath. Um, from the stomach, you can have breath issues, things like that. And in fact, uh, there's a new with a veggie dent, and I'll put that in the veggie dent um, treats. They have something that helps denty veggie dent fresh that helps the oral breath a little bit, but also has inulin to help with a GI. That may be something to try, but you know what? Maybe every six months, a good cleaning. Sometimes I'll even have that oronasal fistula. Boxer girl, 11 years old, meds for arthritis and thyroid, give probiotics, great on walks, alerts. Uh, seems to be doing great, but how much is normal sleep pattern during the day? She sleeps well at night. Well, the normal sleep pattern is going to increase as they get older. Uh, as long as you're showing those things that she does seem to be able to get, do well on work, walks, alerts when she's alert, that type of thing, that's pretty darn good. Um, the CBD, dish, if she gets that at night, that may make her a little bit sleepier. I don't know. Do they get the munchies? Um, I don't think so. Um, but it looks at, at 11 years old for a boxer and she's doing pretty good with her meds. That sounds pretty darn good. So she might, with the meds for arthritis, uh, she might even do well with a joint supplement. You can ask your veterinarian. And I uh, also talk about the CC loop, especially if she has some specific areas. And uh, yeah, they are going to sleep more. I mean, I like naps a little bit more these days. Okay. So certainly the pain and discomfort. One other thing about the boxer, if she has a really active day and wakes up the next morning and is kind of stiff, that, then you know that that arthritis has been just a little bit challenged, but as long as she works out of it, then you can look at other, other things to do. So we mentioned medication. There are some excellent medications out there, usually some form of NSAID, non-steroidal, um, carprofen such as Rimadyl, Galaprant. There's some really good ones out there, and most of them are very safe for long-term use. There's a very small percent that will have an individual or in idiosyncratic reaction well, then you can't use that on your particular pet. There's also good supplements and good supplements within specific diets that can be helpful. So we'll look at uh, a lot of these are going to have the um, glucosamine type things, lots of products, lots of variability. Again, I would stick with, with the companies that really have good research. Nutramax has some very good products along those lines. Um, I like their products as well. And then there's some, some of the uh, joint diets that are available as well. Think of it is just kind of like with us, when we need it, we're gonna take medication, uh, either prescribed or sometimes over the counter. We're, I take supplements. Um, diet, I'm kind of not doing so well on because I could be lighter and that would help me get around better, but it may, I'll, I'll, I am taking a supplement, so maybe that helps. But then we also look at physical therapy, complementary ways. And I have certain exercises I do when I'm having problems with my bursitis. And I try to do some yoga and stretch. And I try to do some exercise. When I need it, I'll go get a good massage. Um, and I won't tell you specifically that I've used the Assisi loop on my hands or hip. But, you know, I've heard stories. So one of the things we're going to talk about today is what's called the ACC loop. You might have noticed all the products listed on the bottom of the slides. And the thing of it, that this technology is actually brought over from human care, which is used primarily with acute pain post-operatively to help with healing inflammation and pain, but also with some chronic pain as well. So it's a targeted 
pulsed electromagnetic field. And as you can see, Buddy, when he used to be with us, he'd be on his nice, soft orthopedic bed. And then when he was resting, I would place the loop and activate it. And it has a barrel-like loop effect on either side of that loop to help with what's called the nitrous oxide production to help increase blood flow, decrease inflammation, decrease pain, and post-operatively even help with healing. When possible, with whatever medication, supplements, or therapy you're doing, exercise is, can be a really good thing. Now, if there's already any kind of orthopedic issues, you have to be careful. You know how they say, check with your doctor before starting this, or check off this box saying you won't hold us responsible if you take this class. Um, so you have to be careful of injuries. And especially if they're a little bit older, overweight, maybe their joints aren't so great, do it in small amounts. Have them do something around the house. And when they're exercising with the owner, it's not just physical enrichment, it's emotional behavioral enrichment as well. So that is really important. And then if it does result in some weight loss, that means there's less strain on those joints if you've got the osteoarthritis or problems such as that. They still can have problems getting around. And I know Dr. Um, Mary did a really good episode just recently on getting around with senior pets. And certainly exercise for mobility. Help them out. Watch those slick floors. We had area rugs all over the house for Buddy because he could not get his, his, his footing very well on slick floors, even when we used the toe grips. I love these docs, Dr. Busby toe grips that you can place on the nails to just help them give a little bit better friction so they can get around without slipping too much. If they're not seeing well, if they don't hear very well and not getting around very well, we joke about don't move the furniture around too much. Make sure they have easy access to where they need to go. And that may include limiting stairs for them. Um, if you have an area in a house that you have to go up and down stairs, maybe go in with a ramp there, certainly looking going for a ramp in and out of the vehicle. And I love it when I see ramp type areas at veterinary clinics as well. So what about dogs who go outside to go to the bathroom? If they're having soiling issues, maybe it hurts for them to get through the doggy door or maybe the cat's litter box side is too high up and they can't get into it comfortably. That may be something to watch out for. One of the biggest things too that can impact owners is cognition issues, behavior issues. They don't adjust to changes as well if there's any new environments, especially if they're adopted or, or moved or something like that. It can really be challenging. So giving them a smaller space initially, environmental enrichment, we talk about food, toys and different things, keeping them engaged, things with different scents to help both dogs and cats. Being pretty scheduled on when they eat, when they go out, things like that. Because as their abilities diminish, you'll be able to pick up on, they may have to go out more. So you need to watch that. So sometimes cognition is purely a brain thing. It's just like people with Alzheimer's. Well, not just like, but very similar. But sometimes a disease can make it worse. With kidney issues, you're gonna have them urinating more and drinking more. Well, those house soiling behavior may not just be from cognition, it may be due to having a lot of urine. On the PurinaInstitute.com, there's a very good posting about cognitive dysfunction, CDS, and it has a DISHA acronym. And in fact, DISHA is now DISHA with two A's because in addition to the disorientation, decrease of an interaction or more, altered sleep patterns, night to day, house soiling and activity, they've actually added anxiety as an additional issue with cognitive dysfunction, okay? So this is a good website to look at that. It even has a little checkoff list. So you can see, okay, is my dog or cat starting to show these signs? And if you go through that questionnaire and see, yeah, there could be some behavioral issues, talk to your veterinarian. There's medications, there's supplements, there's 
training that can be done. So again, let's get to these issues fairly early. And specifically with anxiety, uh, it does increase as cognition, hearing and, and vision decreases. They can be startled more easily. They can have greater separation anxiety. They can have more anxiety going to the vet clinic or with thunderstorms, things like that. Well, addition to the regular ACC loop, ACC now has a calmer canine loop that goes on the pet's head. Again, buddy, we had moved from a house to an apartment for a few months and then to another house. And we use the calmer canine loop to help decrease his level of anxiety and separation anxiety. And it really seemed to help him out a bunch. So in addition to behavior, all of these things, that's, that's why general practitioners are the best senior caregivers, because they have to look at everything. They don't just look at behavior. They don't just look at diet. They don't just look at teeth. But if you can keep a good folder with all your information from your vet visits, I like even keeping a spreadsheet or something with the medications. And maybe about every two months looking at, are there behavior changes, weight changes? How's the eating going? Don't, don't do it every day. Get some good pictures quarter to quarter every six months. If you ever notice that there's a mass on your dog, take a picture of it, place a penny or something in the picture, and then you can compare it to later times and determine, is this really getting bigger or is it the same size? So you can help with this information as you're looking working with your veterinary team. Specifically with medications and supplements, we don't have a lot of polypharmacy information on pets yet, but it's a big issue in people. But set up a spreadsheet or a calendar, making sure you know what is given at what time, with food or without food, who, who gave it, make sure they check it off so there's not a double dose given or a dose missing. And sometimes you may have picked up something online or something that's been recommended. There could be an interaction with a prescribed medication or other supplement that you need to, need to worry about. Then with cats, some dogs, there's only so many medications you can give an individual cat. So sometimes you have to prioritize working with your veterinary team to decide which is the most important to give. Again, we're going to go with a holistic. We're gonna look at what's appropriate with good medication, possibly even procedures, but are there complements to that? Can we use supplements that won't interfere with medications? Can we use the CC loop? Can we use massage? Whatever we can use, we're gonna hopefully keep our pet as healthy as possible. And we're gonna help with that too. But then comes the difficult discussions. When does that quality of life start to decline and how bad is it? So remember, we talked about pain, huge. And that, that works in with the mobility too. Can they get around? Mobility in a 10 pound poodle isn't gonna be as much as it is for a 110 pound Great Dane. So that's gonna have an impact there. You can carry the little poodle outside if you need to or carry them in your purse. So mobility, Depends on the size of the dog sometimes. How's their appetite? How's their body condition? How's their elimination? Are they becoming incontinent? And why you can measure some things with little check boxes? Happiness. Are they interacting with you? What, what's your gut feel? Do they seem to be relatively content? And those are tough questions. So it's not by gray muzzle, it's by lap of love, Mary Gardner, she may have shown this in the other one. They actually have an app that you can put on your phone that you can measure the good days in green, the yellow days in neutral or neutral and the bad days are red. And for each calendar day, at the end of the day, you can put down red, yellow or green. And you'll probably see that shift with a lot of green, a few yellow, to a few more yellows, to now we're getting to the reds, and sometimes looking at it in color can help you decide when's the right time for your family, for you and your pet and your family. But we want to keep that time as distant as possible 
And we want to keep those green days as much as possible because our pets are living longer. We have better resources to take care of them. If you take care of them throughout those life stages, a lifetime of care can definitely increase their longevity, their lifespan, and their health span. And as we work together as a team, we can work with your pets too. So while I answer the last of the questions, um, uh, Assisi Animal Health sponsored my talk today. And in fact, um, they have some specials for pet owners. You can get this these items online and you can get some gifts. So just so you have the information there as well, I'm gonna go to the questions as we talk about that. Uh, the Embrace Relief System, I am not as um, familiar with. I believe it's more of a, uh, compressive type that helps, but the AOC group, um, I will actually do a little bit more look on that because I'm actually developing good resources from everything for senior pets. Uh, so I know there has not been done any comparative studies. I know that for a fact because they're slightly different uh, venues. Recommending for dental hygiene. My recommendation for dental hygiene is whatever your pet will let you do. And that can be a challenge. Um, there are some smaller pets that really don't like a lot of manipulation. Full toothbrush, circular motion with all the teeth is the best by far, Do it, done daily, absolutely. The finger brush does have a little bit of an abrasive effect. It depends on how far you can be get back because most calculus is going to be on these upper fourth premolars. That's where the salivary ducts uh, deposit and then the rest of the teeth as well. Sometimes if they don't like the finger brush, I'll go with a wipe and I'll write this into the, uh, the there's a maxi guard wipe. And what I do with those is I actually put it on my finger and I work from the front of the face and actually just kind of rub the cheek back and then rub it back far enough that I can get a wipe on the tooth surface itself. Now you're doing a great job trying to get some brushing done. But again, if we just brushed and never went to the dentist, we'd still have lots of disease happening. So continue with a combination of treatment with that. Okay. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, let's see if we have any more questions. And if not, I think uh, we're good to go. I went over just, no, two minutes. Yay. I worked just right. Was that okay, Lisa? That was terrific. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you sharing your knowledge and um, answering questions. So thank you very much. We really appreciate Absolutely. it. And thanks to everybody for joining us. And we look forward to our next webinar. More on okay. that soon. But and I'll get you all those websites I talked about. Terrific. Thank you so much. Okay, Have bye. Have a good rest of the day, everybody. Take care. Thanks for joining bye. us. Oh, one more question. Two chats. Oh, just that.